Good morning. My name is Danae Doris and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for joining our webinar today. ASEF is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood, K-12, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. We are excited to have two wonderful presenters joining us today for this webinar entitled Architectural Programming for the Learner. Greg Stack is an educational architect, designer, and writer. Mr. Stack has authored articles and presented at a variety of national and international conferences on a range of K-12 subjects. He has designed numerous K-12 college and university facilities during his 33-year career in architecture. Mr. Stack specializes in creating environments that enhance learning. Mr. Stack is accompanied today by Stephen Shiver. Over the past two decades, Mr. Shiver has managed the planning, design, and construction of over $250 million in educational and state facilities. As an accomplished educational planner, Mr. Shiver has received many regional and national awards and regularly speaks at national conferences on educational facilities planning and design. Mr. Shiver co-chairs the American Institute of Architects Committee on Architecture and Education, Pre-K through 12 subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Stack and Mr. Shiver, for sharing your expertise with our audience today. During today's webinar, the ASEF staff will be assisting Mr. Stack, Mr. Shiver, and all participants. At the conclusion of today's session, we will provide a list of upcoming events, and we encourage you to visit the site for future updates as well. Good morning. Today we're going to be talking about architectural programming for the learner. We'll define architectural programming, but really the focus of this presentation is going to be on the factors you need to consider uh, when designing a school. Rather than a how-to of architectural programming, this is, uh, session is really going to look at how architectural programming can form a framework for considering the transactions between students and teachers. I'm Greg Stack. And I'm Steve Shiver. Uh, it's sometimes said that a, a good teacher could teach under a tree, but with rain, storms, insects, heat and cold, why would you want to? People choose their environments if they can and suffer through them if they can't. And learners and teachers are really no different. They want to teach in an environment that is comfortable and convenient for them. But what does a student need from their environment to succeed? Well, to really succeed, students need to feel safe, to have clean air, natural daylight, temperature that's comfortable, water, uh, to be part of an organization or something that's larger than they are. Uh, to feel like they belong, to feel valued uh, by other people uh, in their school, and to be challenged and engaged uh, in the school environment. But how do we think of these needs in a school context? One way to do that is to use Abraham Maslow as a starting point. Uh, Maslow was a psychologist and in 1943 wrote a theory of human motivation. He believed uh, that humans have basic instinctive needs and really they must fulfill those needs in order. So in order to fill a higher need, you have to fill a lower need first. He, uh, he thought that environments hindered people from fulfilling their needs and interestingly he thought education was an environment that uh, hindered uh, people meeting their needs. Maslow uh, had this pyramid, which is Maslow's hierarchy. And at the bottom, you see biological uh, and physiological needs. So, for instance, if uh, anyone had to go to the restroom right now and had to step out, well, that's a need that you have to uh, 
fulfill before you can think about other things. And it's the same thing as you sort of go up this chart. Uh, you're, you'll jeopardize your safety to fulfill biological needs. You'll, once you feel safe, then you want to fulfill social needs. Once those are fulfilled, you want to go and have esteem, have recognition. And at the top of the pyramid is uh, self-actualization in Maslow's terms. Well, what we've done is we've taken that hierarchy and uh, developed the hierarchy of learner needs. And at the bottom, again, are physiological needs, access to water, access to light, uh, and, and those kinds of things. As we go forward and, and students have those needs met, they need to feel safe. They need freedom from isolation, uh, passive supervision. When these net needs are met, people have to have their social needs met. Uh, they need a place to call home. They need to identify with the group. The group size is kind of an interesting phenomenon. The uh, Robin Dunbar, who is an anthropologist at Oxford University, has talked about what the ideal size of uh, a social group is. And she puts it at, or actually I don't know if it's a she or a he, but they put that at the size of 150, and this is referred to as the Dunbar number. And that's the number of uh, people and relationships you can have that your cognitive power of your brain supports. You have to remember uh, what's my relationship to a person, how am I supposed to act before them, and so on. Even if you're not doing that consciously, you are making those subliminal decisions. So 150 is a, is a good number. Uh, Facebook has looked at this and they think of 120 as a number. I belong to a variety of social networking uh, sites, and uh, though I might have two or 250 or 300 people that are on those sites, I'm probably only going to be connected in, a, in the way this is describing to between 120 and 150. After people feel that connection, uh, they need to feel esteem. They need to demonstrate the knowledge of their accomplishments. And only when all of those needs are met can students really concentrate on the top of the pyramid here and be self-actualized. And in our context, for our purposes, we can think of that as really when authentic learning is taking place. Here are some examples of school environments that don't meet these physiological needs. In the upper left, you can see an example of poor ventilation, which in a lot of schools might lead to kids being sick more often, more incidences of asthma, and therefore more absences from school and potentially lower test results. As we move around, you can see failing shelter there in the middle where the building's actually falling apart, and then artificial light. It's been proven in both office and educational environments that uh, people desire natural daylight, and uh, there have been a number of studies that have shown that it helps improve scores. And then poor acoustics, especially in elementary schools where young children are learning new words and learning how to enunciate. They need to be able to hear the instructor pronounce and say the words. And then privacy. Uh, so many schools have restrooms that none of us on this uh, webinar would ever want to uh, use. There is a response to those kinds of needs that's possible. Uh, and here are some examples of what those might look like. In the upper left is a school in Finland that Steve and I visited. And they take a very different approach to restrooms. Rather than sort of being the uh, uh, neglected uh, necessity, restrooms, those doors on the left, are private and individual and serve a single house. So students uh, feel a little bit more ownership. You don't uh, mess up something that you own. And so consequently, they've had much better success in allowing this to happen. Why is that important? Well, research has shown that dehydration uh, hinders learning. Uh, students are going to uh, regress in their learning 5 to 10 percent if they're dehydrated. In American schools that have bad restrooms, what you find are that students don't drink water because they're afraid to use the restrooms. If they don't drink water all day, they become dehydrated and their learning suffers. So it's something as easy as that. Uh, good acoustics, good ventilation, much natural light are all important factors for having appropriate physiological responses. So as we move up the pyramid, 
we see some examples here of where safety needs of students and for that matter staff are not being met by these facilities. Uh, restrooms again with personal safety and privacy concerns, uh, personal space, trespassing within individuals personal space shown on the upper right, and then areas in schools where students either feel trapped or they feel like there's not enough supervision and so there's opportunities for students to be bullied or picked on. And then on, in a number of larger schools you see many spaces where, where the building is isolated or the space is isolated and students don't feel part of the larger whole. The response to safety needs is really visibility, transparency, and the ability to see. This allows passive supervision, it allows choices and pathways, and it, it really makes the school more inclusive. In the upper left in this photo, this is pretty much a view from an assistant pr principal's office in a middle school. So they can supervise the commons, the locker bay, and beyond the locker bay, they can actually get a glimpse of the bus zone. These other uh, areas show visibility. And often you see in modern schools that uh, teachers want to go in classrooms, they want to paper up the windows if the, uh, up to the interior if there are any, and want to be in isolation. And sometimes uh, that's supported on the misguided notion that that's safer that uh, in a lockdown situation you, you want to do that. Yeah, you may want to do that during a lockdown, but really you want it as open as possible so that if anything uh, comes in, if an intruder is there, you can see that intruder immediately and begin to take appropriate action. You can't do that in a, in a box that it has no connection to the exterior. And many older schools don't, and a lot of new schools, don't address the social needs of students and to some extent the social needs of uh, the staff members. At a conference I attended recently, participants were asked to recall a significant occurrence or learning experience uh, within their high school uh, tenure. And the vast majority of the people in the space, including myself or in the conference, really found that they learned more outside of the classroom and they remember unique experiences that happened uh, outside of the classroom. And these pictures here really indicate places where students are overcrowded, they're trying to learn in corridors, uh, a lack of identity. You can see the desks over on the right side where they're just lined up in a row like a factory. So these are the types of things that we're trying to address in the new school designs that we're doing. So a response to social needs could be something like these. In the upper left you see a house situation. These two young boys are there after school. They just like being there and it's an area that they can call home. Uh, informal groupings like on the lower right uh, or the slide in the middle on the bottom is students getting together so that they can learn in social situations. Uh, all learning is social it has been said and that is certainly, uh, certainly true and certainly something that our schools need to recognize as we prepare spaces for the future. So what kind of message are we sending to students and to the teachers in these buildings about their value to society? When we see old science rooms where modern experiments can't be completed, where we see the grounds that aren't well kept, where we look at uh, corridors that are uh, very impersonal, uh, how do kids in these facilities receive recognition for their work? How do they have a, an ability to demonstrate their competence or mastery of a subject? Again, what kind of message are we sending to our kids? Next we have a little quiz. Uh, look at the pictures at the bottom of this uh, slide and then on the next slide uh, we're going to ask you to respond to what you think about these corridors we're showing. and. Uh, the, the question is, which one of these is the prison? So please uh, use your tools uh, for the webinar there and uh, vote uh, for the one on the left, the one in the center, or the one on the right as to which one you think is the prison. So what I think we'll do is we'll go on a couple slides and remember left, center, right, and uh, we'll reveal the answer to you in, in just a bit. Now, schools can meet esteem needs by providing places to demonstrate their competence. Here's two young ladies that are showing the model they built. You can also show that uh, you, the students and what goes on in the school is valued through
through the grounds. Here are grounds of a, another school in Finland. It has a nice copse of uh, birch trees with picnic tables in it. It's a nice place to be. It's well kept. And the buildings uh, also exhibit that kind of thing. But the other side uh, of a scheme also has to do with the staff and treating the staff professionally. In the lower right corner, you see a staff room from uh, another Finnish school. And when you look at it, it really is a professional looking space. It's the kind of lounge or staff room that you would find in a corporate office. And uh, I think that tells the staff that what they do is important and they're treated, they're treated as professionals. As we move up to the top of the pyramid, we see a lot of schools that provide no opportunities for students to experience self-actualization. Uh, as you can see in these photos, where are opportunities for students to be engaged or to engage each other or to even engage uh, with staff members or teachers? Uh, where are opportunities for students to be creative? There's very little autonomy in these photos and there is really no way to customize learning. Schools can encourage uh, self-actualization though. Uh, the picture on the upper left will tell a story about that in a bit. But you can also uh, inspire kids. Uh, rigor, relevance, and relationships are the new three R's. And having a rigorous uh, academic offering is important and having the spaces to do that. You can see in the lower right that here is sort of a, a couch conference area that allows kids to get together in really a pretty untraditional way. And in the upper right, this little, little gentleman is using his uh, technology. Now he's really a definition of a, of a digital native and it's really something that's not going to go away that schools need to feel, figure out how to exploit properly. But we'll give you the, the answer to uh, the test at, at this point. When you remember uh, those three slides, the one on the left was actually the prison. And the way you can tell that is it's the only one that had a window. So what is architectural programming? Architectural programming is the research and decision-making process that we use as architects to figure out what it is we need to design. Uh, to understand what needs to be designed, architects need to understand what goes on in a space and what sort of human transactions take place. That's why it's important to understand the users, in this case students and teachers, and what they need in order to be successful. So let's, let's go forward and examine that now. This is one of my personal favorite cartoons to take out to the construction site while we're working on a building. And it's actually one I like to use when we start talking with staff during the programming process on a building. And it really speaks to communication. And it, it shows, obviously, that the king, the architect, and the contractor weren't communicating very well about where to build the moat. And programming is really about communication. It's about communicating needs by developing a deep understanding of all of the team members that are involved in the process of what will be designed and why it's being designed, rather than just getting directions or giving directions without meeting. It's about the nuances of every decision that's made. Programming at some level has been around since man first started modifying shelter. It's evolved to follow formal rules like order, symmetry, layering, and scale. And at least when I was in college in the late 70s and early 80s, we studied the 1960s book Problem Seeking, where we identified the problems to be solved through the design of a project. But today, we've really made a transition to looking at a building design holistically and in an integrated format, identifying all of the aspects of a building, including the functional, aesthetic, technical, community, and environmental factors that need to influence a project. Let's turn to programming for schools. Uh, a familiar American icon is the one-room schoolhouse, and the program for that was build a place where as anybody who is interested in education can come to, and oh yeah, it can't be bigger than can be heated by a pot-bellied stove. So that was a pretty simple program that, I'm not sure how well it worked, but it was the program that was in use for a long time. 
Well, as the Industrial Revolution got underway, more people with greater literacy were required to keep track of accounts, write orders, and do, do clerical tasks. These tasks required greater literacy, and so inspired by the very Industrial Revolution that was providing the need for these tasks, it was determined that more people had to be educated. And looking at the mass production that was beginning to happen at that time, that model was inadvertently applied to schools. I, I don't know if it was intentional, if it just happened, but it was applied to schools. And sco schools were designed to mass produce workers that needed a certain level of education. So the raw material was the student. The process was education, which was value added. And at the other end, the finished product, which was a person who graduated from wherever grade they graduated from, came out the other end. Well, we still have that system largely intact today. And the way it works is uh, students still go through it. And oh yeah, in, in an industrial process, there are students, there are rejects, there are things that do not conform to standards. And those are either put aside and redeveloped or just put aside and, and wasted. And unfortunately, in the United States today, only about 70% of students who are entering high school are graduating. And so consequently, the system is creating uh, students that are, that are put to the side in, in that sense. In addition, at the same time, uh, democracy was taking hold, especially in the United States. And the founding fathers really believed that the electorate needed to be able to read and write in order to be uh, responsible participants in democracy. And so that was part of the idea. Now this model has been around since eight, 1850. And uh, really, a lot of new schools still follow that, schools that are being designed. Part of the way schools are designed today, in many areas, uh, something called an educational specification is created. And the educational specification puts the needs of teachers and learners in uh, qualitative terms. Sometimes they're, they're quantitative, but trying to say what the students and teachers need. Unfortunately, very often, uh, what an EdSpec says is we need what we have, only it has to be bigger with more storage. So consequently, it's, it's looking at the predominant paradigm that's been with us since 1850 and, and is trying to improve that rather than look at something new for the, for the next century. So as the ed educational specification gets completed and we move into the design process, does design really matter? And certainly design can provide, you know, for, for solutions for physical comfort, help refine sensibilities, affect the attitude of students and teachers, and it's really actually critical for the purpose design spaces, for instance, like a science lab. But does design really affect academic outcomes? To uh, get your opinion on that, here's another little quiz. And uh, in case you can't read this, it's what effect does the place in which students learn have on achievement? 0%, 3%, 5%, 10%, or 15%. Uh, please uh, go ahead and, and do that. And as we go through the next few sides, we'll tell you what uh, our research shows the effect of this might be. And we find that people's opinion on this uh, does, in fact, vary quite Quite widely. So what is the research showing? And, and uh, if you haven't filled out your survey, don't jump to any conclusions by these next few slides. The research uh, shows a variety of things. Here is a paper produced in uh, 2002 that was an analysis of a, a variety of research. And it cites that one study of, uh, of the paper that says, Facility measures explain 10 to 15 percent of the difference in test scores after controlling for student demographics. So I've cited a paper that shows that uh, shows that here. Here's another one: is the 21st uh, Century School Fund that says research uh, shows that the condition of school facilities has a measurable effect over and above socioeconomic conditions on student achievement and teacher experience and turnover. They don't cite any specific statistics, but they are saying there is an effect. Here's another one that's, uh, that's more recent. This one is uh, from 2008. And ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, 
uh, and air conditioning engineers commissioned this study to try to see how did the difference in outdoor air supply, what effect did that have on performance? And they found a 14.5% on performance every time you doubled the amount of outside air. Now, when you think of this, this makes some intuitive sense in that if you're in a stuffy room, how many of you have been dr drowsy as you're listening to somebody like Steve and I drone on in a, in a presentation? Drowsiness uh, affects attention, the increase in CO2 affects attention. So ASHRAE has been, uh, who commissioned this study is saying it's better. The diagram below is a uh, system of displacement ventilation that we've used on projects that uh, allows 100% outside air. And through this mechanism, we're hoping that we're helping kids learn better. Well, now let's go to the answer to the, to the quiz. And the answer is that when you look at a meta-analysis of really all the research, that we feel it's safe to say that the school environment can affect student success by 3 to 5 percent. That's a statistically significant amount. And I'm not saying that if you have uh, poor teachers and uh, other kinds of situations that you're going to get this result. But if you have uh, situations where uh, all else is equal, good facilities are going to help success by this amount over bad facilities. And I think we, we can see that. Okay, what are the characteristics of a student-centered learning environment? There's still a debate in educational service circles about whether teaching and learning should be teacher-centered or learning-centered. And this makes a big difference to architects. So a teacher-centered environment is a, what I'll call a traditional classroom. It ha it's focused on the teacher. It probably has a whiteboard these days rather than a chalkboard. It might have a smart board on what is commonly referred to as the teaching wall. There will be a projector. Uh, there can be overhead projectors. The teacher is usually at the front of the room, and desks very often are still in rows facing the teacher. And the teacher is the person who is giving knowledge and direct instruction uh, to the class. And there's a certain uh, proportion of instruction that this makes perfect sense for, but there's other parts that this may not make sense. So a student-centered environment focuses on the learner, and the teacher acts as sort of a guide uh, on the side rather than uh, that person in front. Student-centered instruction tends to use project-based learning and other experiential learning modalities that require uh, a different kind of space from a teacher-centered environment. Since uh, the move currently is toward more student-centered learning, we'll be focusing on student-centered environments. And the first step in understanding student-centered environments is really examining the transactions between students and teacher in a learner-centered environment. So this photo is a perfect example of the guide on the side that uh, Greg mentioned where the teacher is spending more time guiding students through the process of learning rather than telling the students uh, what to learn. And you can see she's helping them what it looks like with the model here. And as the student-centered learning uh, becomes more prevalent, it's actually, we're finding, is more rigorous than, than a typical lecture-based or teacher-centered uh, environment. And this is a good example here of a science room where students have actually come in uh, before class uh, because they're excited about what they're learning. It's rigorous because students are involved. They're not passive recipients of what they're learning. They're active participants in their learning. Uh, Student-centered learning also uh, has teaching in parallel rather than in series. And what I mean by this is in a traditional school, you go into English class for 45 minutes, the bell rings, you go to social studies, the bell rings, you go to math, the bell rings, science, and so on. That's teaching in, uh, in series, one after the other. Teaching in parallel suggests that teaching across the curriculum might be a better approach. It's actually much more what all of us do as we do our jobs. We're not just doing one thing at a time in the sense of using only English. We're using English uh, relative to math, relative to understanding business, relative to a lot of other things. 
and we're communicating all the time, and that's really what's important about it. As an example of this kind of learning, here's this slide, and I think this is this is a pretty uh, terrific thing. This was at a conference at uh, in San Diego, and this was High Tech High in San Diego, and we were being toured around High Tech High by a sophomore. And so he walked right past us, and I said, "Wait a minute, what's what's going on here?" And he said, "Oh, that's our that's our project." And I said, "Well, here, tell me about it." And he said, well, the assignment was to find somebody in Af find somebody from Africa and interview them and determine what a problem in their home country is that needs to be solved and also find out from them what materials might be available locally to solve it. Then we had to figure out how to use, how to solve the problem using local materials. And this, this is the result as they're experimenting. The problem, and I don't recall the country, was uh, clean water. So what they're constructing here is a solar still. And they have, I think, plexiglass, although I'm not sure that would be available in, in Africa, but I guess glass probably would. They've lined a, a wood box with uh, plastic sheeting, and dirty water goes in one end. The top is tilted, and so as the sun heats the water, it condenses on the glass and rolls down to the other side and is clean. So what they had to do is this interview, they had to design this thing. They had to calculate how much water this thing would produce. They had to understand the physics of that. They had to understand the biology of how pure the water would be. They then had to write up this report and they had to make a presentation in front of their class. And these kids were just absolutely engaged in this endeavor. It was very relevant to them as well. So you can see here that they've covered math, science, English, social studies, all across the curriculum in a very relevant way that is also very rigorous. Students today are digital natives, and digital technology is quickly making its way into uh, learner-centered environments. And in one example is uh, in southwest Washington, uh, the Vancouver School District, it's right uh, just across the Columbia from Portland, has actually been distributing both iPads and uh, iPods uh, to elementary students. And students are actually receiving a good amount of their uh, instructional material on these electronic devices. A learner-centered environment allows students to gain a fuller understanding of materials before moving on. Rather than time between bells being the constant, mastery of the subject or subjects is the constant. A learner center environment also uh, recognizes that learning can happen at any time and in any place. Here the girls are outside on the sidewalk, uh, you know, sharing information, talking, communicating. These other examples are places where you know, kids like to lie around, they like to lounge, they like to have soft seating just like anybody else would as they conduct their, their learning. A learner-centered environment really promotes the type of social relationships that you would see in the typical office or professional environment, thereby encouraging relationships between the students because they're working together uh, as teams on many different projects. A learner-centered environment provides students with opportunities for learning in various size groups, and the designs of our building need to be able to accommodate that. And a learner-centered environment is likely to teach 21st century skills of communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. So there's a lot of rigor there. People take these skills for granted, but they're not, uh, there's a lot of uh, indications that these skills are not something that you just develop on the side. Uh, there's not many people that teach these skills directly, but the environment can contribute to allowing kids to form the right group sizes to allow these to happen. And a learner-centered learn, learner environment uh, actually helps students in our high-stakes testing uh, that they need to do today because it allows them to demonstrate mastery using performance, presentation, multimedia, and more. So they're learning in their learning style and then are able to master the subjects prior to taking the mandatory testing. So what are the universal considerations for facilities when programming for learner-centered environments? 
The first one we'd like to cover is that students and teachers really need a home base. Uh, here uh, on the right, you see a, a teacher office space, and on the left, that's actually student home base, again, in another high-tech, high environment. But it's really something that students need. They need to have the, the safety of saying, I can have a place to go to call my own. I can have social relationships that I can count on. Nobody really likes to be tranching all the time. Uh, when you design schools, teachers don't like that. Kids don't like that. And when you think about it, if you had came into an office every day where you worked and you had to have a different desk every day, uh, you wouldn't like that either. So having a home base is important. Those same spaces that allow for learning in various size groups also allow for uh, formal and informal groups to form uh, from a social standpoint. And by providing spaces that are not too small or not too large, students feel connected within those individual groups. A learner-centered environment also can accommodate project-based learning. Uh, students uh, love to do projects. They can learn a lot from projects. And uh, for a space to accommodate that, it needs to provide for that. There's an outdoor space on the upper right. The young man on the lower right is working on robots. And the other thing you have to consider is when you do projects, you do need space to store those projects. As we mentioned, many kids, or almost all of our kids, are digital natives. And so a learner-based environment does not require students to power down. We understand you know, why we don't want kids on cell phones during class or texting during class. But there's other ways that those devices can be used to help students learn. And as I mentioned, the example is Vancouver School District's been using those devices for exactly that. Students do a variety of presentations in a learner-centered environment, and that allows them to demonstrate their mastery of both the media and the mastery of the subjects that they're learning about. Student-centered environment should foster community. When I say community, again, go back to that 120 to 150 ideal size. So if you have a group of classrooms, that's four to five classrooms, that's going to give you between 100 and 150, depending on how many kids are in a classroom, students that come to know each other. But just having the classrooms together really isn't enough. They need a place to have that connection. So uh, the picture on the left is actually an elementary school that has a shared space between four classrooms accommodating between 100 and 120 students. You can see here is a lounge space, a couple of different lounge spaces. And those are important because it fosters that kind of connection between teachers and students, teachers and teachers, and students and students that really fulfill the need for safety and socialization in the hierarchy of needs that we talked about earlier. So I think you can see that one of the main focuses of a learner-centered environment is giving students an opportunity to develop and enable relationships in a variety of different group sizes. And you can see that in the slide there. A learner-centered environment also must challenge students to think of and interact with their environment. And these three schools here uh, really respond to that. On the left side is, is one example of about 15 signs in an elementary school that talk about the different characteristics of this particular school. And this one demonstrates how the wetlands that are adjacent to the school were restored, the type of wildlife that are in the wetlands, and give students an opportunity to really think about the environment around them and be exposed to uh, different aspects of the building. Uh, the picture, larger picture on the upper right, is a project that's currently in design. It's actually, we'll have a lighting system that will change color uh, as the power usage uh, within the building changes. So as the power, when they're using more power, the lights will be red, and when they're using the least amount of power, the lights will be blue. And the idea here is to change behaviors, to get uh, people, students, and teachers to open the blinds and turn the lights off. And it's also an elementary school where there's a window into a mechanical room, and kids can see how the building really works. A learner-centered environment also encourages teachers to collaborate. If you want teachers to teach across the curriculum, you got to give them both a place to collaborate and some time to coordinate their activities. 
uh, in today's era of budget woes, that's a, that's a tall order and a difficult order, but it's an important thing to do. So that collaboration certainly occurs among teachers who are meeting with each other, but it really also uh, the facilities can encourage collaboration in the classroom. So here we have an elementary school with a diagonal operable wall that can open and allow two classrooms to come together. The advantage of this is this wall is relatively short. Uh, it doesn't take up valuable wall space that can be used uh, in this case for a conference room, but also for display and other kinds of storage. So that's an important consideration. I think a learner center environment also allows uh, kids to learn from each other. So there's sort of a peer tutoring aspect to it. Uh, if you're familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, uh, Bloom suggested that uh, st you, you know best what you're able to teach to others. So having students teach each other and creating spaces that allow that to happen is really a critical aspect of a modern school. When you think of bigger and bigger class sizes, it's logical that getting kids to help each other is certainly one way to help that situation. And here is a, uh, an example of one such thing. This is the fifth grade exploration studio, which was the winner of Slate Magazine's online competition to reinvent the American classroom. This was our entry, which was the, was the winner. And as you can see, the classroom is divided into learning teams of six students each around the perimeter. The teacher has a home base. Each student has a home base. And then the center of the classroom is completely open where it says arts and sciences for project-based learning or reconfiguration in a number of ways. The classroom spills to the exterior, allows for experimentation outside, storytelling, raising crops, looking at a, a stream or water course that's going by, and the space outside of the classroom is an area where many classes can come together and be very, very flexible. This kind of classroom will allow direct instruction where students can turn around and look at a teacher, and the teacher standing in the middle of the room can see every student uh, and so can retain the control that is important at this level. Now that we better understand the role of architectural programming for the learner, how do we go about developing a plan to program schools? The first thing you need to do is develop a vision. And a, divi a division, I'm sorry, a vision defines uh, how you want to deliver education. Now, a vision can come from one individual who is uh, a person that says this is the way we should do it. But in our experience, that vision should really come from a group of people, a group of stakeholders who put together collectively what they believe is the direction they want to, uh, want to go in. Uh, after you have that vision, the next step is to create a learning plan. Now, this is a diagram that I've adapted from George Copa, who is a former professor at the University of Oregon. And the idea of a learning plan uh, as distinct from a facilities plan is, uh, think of it this way. If you want to go on a journey, you have to know where you're going before you can set your GPS to get you there. So if the facilities plan is the GPS that's going to get you there, the learning plan is figuring out where you're going. So you're, you're looking at everything from the organization of the school to how collaborative you want teachers to be, uh, how many periods a day you can have periods, how you're actually physically going to deliver a curriculum. So all those things have to occur in the learning plan, and you have to be down that pathway before you really begin looking at facilities. Although it's possible for uh, school administrators to develop a plan, we have seen the most successful learning plans uh, be developed with teaching staff involved. Uh, teachers are the ones who are going to implement the plan, and teachers alone can't produce it, but at the same time the administrative staff alone can't produce it. And so Together, they can produce the guidance of the vision and help with the change. The next step is to assemble a programming team. And this team might include the architects, the designers, 
uh, teachers, staff, community members, students, parents, neighbors, administrators, uh, community and business partners, and any other stakeholders uh, in the project. So the learning plan is finished and you're, you've developed a, a team to look at it and your first task is to figure out what are the implications of the learning plan for the facilities plan. Are you going to have small learning communities? Are you going to have schools within a school? Are you going to have departments? Are you going to have houses? There's a lot of big organizational pictures and a lot of details that are necessary uh, in order to understand uh, what you want to do. Once you've had those implications, uh, a goal setting process is in order to understand that, well, we, we know how we want to organize, but what are our goals for our project, for our development, for where we want to go? How much autonomy do we want to give people? What's our curriculum uh, goals? Uh, how are we going to operate the program? Uh, all of those are considerations uh, that you have to establish in order to, to go forward. And as the facilities plan begins, uh, the more technical work of evaluating existing facilities needs to occur. And we need to identify whether existing facilities are able to satisfy the lower level needs of the hierarchy of learner needs. Are they flexible enough to change? Are they in good enough condition uh, to be worth renovating? And are they in the right condition to address uh, the learning plan that's being put together? And are they able to support student-centered learning? And as we move on, the next step would be determine, to determine the requirements for the building. How is the building going to be designed? How is it configured? How is the site going to be designed and configured? How is the building and site going to operate? How are the different areas going to function? What is the environment within the building and outside of the building going to be like? The size, of course, cost. And this occurs using focus groups, questionnaires, and interviews with all of the stakeholders in the project. So at this point, you, if you've used this process properly, you have uh, probably too many options. And so the next step is to figure out how do we narrow options down from many, many options to ones that make sense to us. And one way is to go back, look at the goals, look at the vision, and develop judgment criteria. So here's an example of a list of judgment criteria you might develop. And you can, you can rank these in, in importance from 1 to 10. They can be cumulative. You can do it any, any way you want. And if you have options, such as represented by this chart on the right, then how do you compare options and judgment criteria to come out to a conclusion? Well, one way you can do that is by adding a third dimension, which is a, a cost-benefit analysis. And here this is looking at, literally at, at physical costs. That's important on the vertical axis with benefits uh, on the horizontal axis. And then by segmenting this chart into four quadrants, and you can, you can do it into more, uh, you, you see that you've got four ranges. Upper left is high costs and low benefits, so you want to stay away from those. In the lower right, you have low costs with high benefits. So those are the ones that you really want to concentrate on. So here, if you had 14 options, this gives you a framework to maybe uh, get those options down to three and then to go forward with further considerations. Costs and those kinds of things on the vertical axis, that's easier actually to establish as uh, what those might be. Benefits is more subjective and that's why you need to go back and visit goals, visit the vision in order to understand what the benefits really are. Finally, uh, schedule is important and this is showing a sample schedule and I, I think the point I'd like to make is that the second uh, blue bar from the top is create the learning plan and the learning plan can take a long time because if you're asking people who uh, have used a learning plan that's maybe a de facto plan that's been used for a long time and you want to codify that or, or, or change it, it's going to take a while for people to get their heads around that. So that's an important step. Very often architects are asked to do architectural programming for schools that, uh, where a learning plan doesn't exist and it's a difficult task because it's tough to know where you want to go 
uh, or tough to know where you're going to end up if you don't know where you want to go. Uh, now, that's not to say that you can't be flexible, that, uh, that flexibility doesn't matter. And in fact, it's a, it's a key and important factor. But you have to have at least an initial idea of how to build flexibility into something that you can use uh, the first day it's open. And with that, I think we uh, have time for a few questions, which I believe are going to be coming in via, via text. It looks like the first question is from Mark, and he asks, many of the innovative designs appear to be outside of the United States. What is holding the United States schools back from engaging in innovative design? Well, that's a good question. I think uh, some of the, the ones we happened to show were outside the, the U.S. and that they were uh, some photos we had. But um, I think it's a different sensibility, in, in my mind, it's a different sensibility as to what will work. People don't believe certain things like uh, individual toilet rooms will work and are unwilling to con invest lots of funds to do that. But there are uh, a number of designs in the United States that really that really do work. So the second question is, what is some advice you can give in selecting an architectural firm that values architectural programming and designing a facility that values the user's needs? I think the advice is that you should ask any architect you're considering uh, about that, whether they, how they go about it, who they include. Uh, in many parts of the country, it's the, the practices for the superintendents to tell the architect, uh, this is what I want. And architects who have grown up in that practice are probably uh, less experienced in sort of the group outreach, the stakeholder outreach, the building community and ownership that is necessary to make uh, this sort of broader vision work. And I think something that you can add to that is uh, talk to potential architects, clients, look at the projects that they have designed in the recent past and find out from their current and past clients uh, what type of involvement they had in the programming process for those schools. I, I guess to expand on the first question that uh, Mark asked, um, what's holding schools back? You know, it, it's not one thing. There's not a, uh, a single answer that, you know, oh, it's the teachers' unions, or oh, it's the administrators, or it's the parents, or it's the facilities. It's really a combination of many, many factors, and those factors vary in each local situation. Uh, I think we found that uh, sometimes uh, it's one thing, but usually it's a multiplicity of things. So Jessica asked, how large was the Agile classroom that you showed? So I think that's the fifth grade class. The fifth grade exploration studio, the one that was shown was 1,000 square feet. Since that time, we've done studies and we're able to accomplish a very similar kind of thing in a square classroom. That was 900 square feet, so we think it's possible. Uh, Dr. Daryl Floyd asked, what kind of advice do you have for school districts who have had a school bond election recently narrowly defeated, which seems to be pretty common right now? It's pretty common. I think that the answer to that, that's a good question, is you need to go back to your electorate and really be involved with them in finding out uh, what their concerns are. We went through a process uh, a few years ago where we had a, a school district of about 8,000 students. Their largest bond in the past had been $20 million. We got a group of citizens together of 50 people. We met with them once a week for almost a year, taking the summer off, really getting them to understand what the situation was and, and what education was about. They then put a bond on the, on the ballot for uh, $140 million, and it passed. So that uh, kind of outreach, there is no easy way to do this. It's going back to the people really educating them as uh, experts, or not, not making them experts, but really explaining what the situation is, and listening to them, giving them the information they need to communicate to their peers. Well, it looks like we're coming to the end of our time here by, by our clock. So 
I uh, want to thank everybody very much for uh, attending this webinar. It's been a pleasure for us to put it on. And as I understand it, this will be on the ACEF website for uh, access uh, after it's over because it's, it's been recorded. ACEF would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenters, Greg Stack and Steve Shiver, and our participants for joining our webinar today. Remember to visit our website at www.acefacilities.org and join us on your preferred social media outlet.